Grave Stormborn is a highly disciplined martial artist committed to improving his skills every day. He draws on the power of wind and lightning. He has a sword, but he was taught from a young age to use it only sparingly. Though primarily a zoner, Grave is a versatile character and that he's able to fight at both long range and up close. His lightning cloud projectile lets him keep opponents away. When they try to jump over it, he can anti-air them with either his knife hand, neutral A attack, or his dragon heart, ground super. This is the basic game plan of the so-called Shoto characters in other fighting games. To mix things up, Grave can hold down the B button to create a bigger but shorter range lightning cloud. This really messes with the opponent's ability to jump over projectiles, and they'll often end up landing in the big cloud. Grave can also control the speed of his normal sized lightning clouds by holding back, neutral, or forward while pressing B to get slow, medium, or fast versions. Grave's double palm reaches pretty far, and his sweep reaches even farther. All of his normal attacks can cancel into his lightning cloud. On the ground, this allows him to do simple two-hit combos. He can jump kick first to do a three damage combo, and that's his bread and butter. Even if these moves are blocked, Grave is still in a good position. Grave Sword Slash reaches far horizontally, and amazingly, it's totally invulnerable, like Dragon Punches in other fighting games. This gives it some incredible uses, but a sword attack is more about prediction than reaction. It has a lot of startup time, but the threat of it keeps opponents on their toes. It's unsafe on block, so only use it when you have a solid read. By the way, you can tell it's unsafe on block by the big red symbol that appears when it's blocked. The red symbol means your opponent will recover first, a blue one means you'll recover first, and the bigger the red symbol, the more time your opponent has to hit you back. Graves' jump A can cross up and lead to a combo. His jumping B can also cross up, and it knocks the opponent down on hit. It has a large horizontal hitbox, so it's great for coming down on top of an opponent. Pressing C in the air summons the wind. You can hold back or forward to summon it in either direction, though it's usually best to blow it toward the opponent. The effect is so powerful that it's limited by his cloud meter, so he must wait several seconds between uses. The wind blows the opponent back, making it difficult for them to get near you during a few seconds that it's in effect. It also powers up two of Grave's other moves. His lightning clouds become bigger and can destroy incoming projectiles and keep going, and his whirlwind strikes lightning below while the wind is blowing. Grave can take advantage of each burst of wind in two main ways. He can use it to intensify his keep away powers, making it very hard for opponents to get near him, or he can go on the offensive with it. It blows himself too, so his jumps become huge and the lightning from his whirlwind is a real threat. If it happens to hit, he can juggle afterwards, including into his super. Grave's ground super does one damage if it's a glancing blow, but if he gets a deep hit, it goes into a special sequence that deals two damage. You'll get that more damaging version if you juggle into it after a lightning strike. Grave's air super is an aerial parry. If the opponent attacks into it with any kind of strike, Grave will parry that attack and will dramatically hit back for two damage. Another important thing to know about Grave is his ability to force block damage. As a general rule in all of Fantasy Strike, when players block a special or super move, the last chunk of their life bar starts flashing. If they block a second special or super move within a few seconds, it will flash faster. If they block a third, they'll lose that point of life, which we call taking block damage. Grave is one of the best characters at dealing block damage because of the combination of the different speeds of his projectile, his large projectile, and his powered up projectiles during the win. Against a knockdown opponent, he can make them get up into a projectile, force him to block another one right after, and he can just apply a lot of pressure this way. During the wind, it's difficult for opponents to avoid taking block damage. Overall, Grave is a versatile character. He can keep opponents away, he can rush them down at least a little, and he can force block damage. He has few weaknesses, and he can adapt to his opponent's strategies well. But can you? Max Geiger is a watchmaker, scientist, and logical thinker. His particular interest lies in the study of time and whether it can be altered or even controlled. Geiger is a zoning character who can control the pace of a match. He's also Fantasy Strike's version of a charge character. Whenever Geiger holds forward, he loses his charge, meaning his gear meter instantly empties. It fills very quickly as long as you either hold back or simply stand in neutral. He can't do either of his two ground special moves or his air C unless he's fully charged up. 
So in other words, he cannot walk forward and use those moves right away. Because his three gear meter moves have this inherent drawback, they're very good in other ways. His first ground special move is Time Spiral. This projectile gear has an unusually short recovery time. And you can hold the B button down to do a delayed version, where Geiger sends the Time Spiral slightly into the future. By delaying your projectile, it lets you fully recover by the time it travels across the screen, so you can follow it and threaten combos or block strings. Geiger's other ground special is Flash Gear with the C button. This is an invulnerable attack and it's one of the best reversals in the game that doesn't cost super meter. He can use it to hit jumpers or simply blow through attacks on the ground. Only the start of it is invulnerable, so try to do it late against jumpers. Your gear recovers quickly enough that you can sometimes throw a time spiral, then flash gear the opponent as they jump over it. Geiger's ground normal moves all have very different purposes. His forward plus A backhand is a long range, fast poke that can potentially combo after a time spiral. In order to do this move, you have to hold forward though, which means you'll lose your gear charge. That can be worth it because his backhand is that good of a poke. His neutral A punch has short range, but it can cancel to specials. That lets him combo to either time spiral or flash gear. But remember to keep holding neutral or back or you'll lose your gear charge. His back plus A step kick allows him to travel forward without actually holding forward, so he can advance a little bit while keeping his gear charge. This move has slow startup, but it's extremely safe on block, allowing him to do pressure strings of several moves. If you hit with a step kick, you can combo to flash gear. And if you counter hit with it, that is, if you hit the opponent out of the startup of their move, you can actually combo into a neutral punch and then into flash gear. Geiger's Jump A is a long horizontal kick, which is good for hitting air to air and also for jumping in to do combos. His Air B is Phase Out, a move that briefly stops time for himself, but not for anyone else. During this brief time, he's completely invulnerable. He can use it to avoid enemy moves, even enemy supers, and to mix up his timing and his jump arc to confuse the opponent. And Geiger can still attack after a Phase Out on the way down. His Air C is a drop gear, a diagonally downward kick. Like any special move, it triggers block damage. You can use it to start pressure strings that threaten even more block damage. You can use it to cross up if you're close. On hit, you can combo off of it. You can't jump forward and use drop gear because it requires you to have full gear meter. This means it's important to consider your spacing so that you can work in a jump straight up C at opportune times. A nice trick is that you can jump forward and phase out, which takes long enough that your gear meter fills up when you're still in the air. Then, drop gear before you land. This lets you threaten some offense while still keeping your options open. Your opponent doesn't know if you'll do air C after the phase out, or kick with A, or simply fall straight to the ground. Geiger's time stop super allows him to casually stroll forward while time is stopped. He walks a fixed distance, then automatically does an invulnerable attack. Think of it as a teleport into an attack. The main use is hitting opponents out of moves from far away, such as their projectiles. Geiger also controls the far upper part of the screen, which is exactly where Jaina wants to be. If she jumps to shoot an arrow, he can time stop to hit her, guaranteed. And if a time spiral hits, or is about to hit, he can time stop to combo for two damage. His air super, Cycloid Revolution, summons a big ball of gears that tracks the opponent. It takes up so much space that it makes it hard for the opponent to move around while it's out. And as they block and wait for it to go away, it gives Geiger plenty of time to grind them down with gears. Geiger can play a standard keep away game with projectiles, backhand pokes, and anti-air, but he can also do lockdown sequences and go on the offense if needed. His versatile time stop super gives him a ton of options on offense and defense as well. And as any watchmaker will tell you, it's time to play Geiger. Setsuki Haruki is a ninja student at the Fox's Den School. She's eager to learn, especially from Grave, and she's incredibly fast, agile, and stealthy. Setsuki is a rushdown character. She has only five hit points, tied for least in the game, but she makes up for it with her ability to overwhelm the opponent with speed and tricks. Let's start with her air moves. Her air A, B, and C are Dive Kick, Kunai Toss, and Flying Fox. Her Flying Fox can be done toward the opponent or away, and she can do it two times before landing. On hit or on block, she can also cancel it into her Dive Kick or her Kunai. Her bread and butter combo is Flying Fox, Dive Kick, Normal Attack, then Super. That's 4 damage, and it's one of the most practical 4 damage combos to land in real matches in the whole game. There's two drawbacks to be aware of here though. 
She can only do this combo if she has super meter, and the flying fox move has pretty low priority. So if you really need a high priority attack, it's best to start with dive kick and only do 3 damage total. Her kunai is a great help here though. When she's far, she can throw it pretty safely and use it as cover. This lets her do flying fox more safely, and it can lead to a whopping 5 damage combo if the opponent somehow happens to get hit by the kunai. It's possible for opponents to hit the kunai out of the air to avoid damage, but it's still a great way to fish for an opening. Now for her ground moves. Her slide is safe on block, and it gives plenty of frame advantage, meaning she recovers before the opponent. Her neutral AA is a two-hit series of knee, then elbow. Her knee is one of the fastest moves in the game. Though it doesn't normally combo to elbow, it's still a good pressure sequence, and if you counter hit with the knee, meaning you hit the opponent out of the start of a move, then it really does combo to the elbow. For example, if someone tries to throw you and you hit them out of their throw attempt with AA, it will be a true combo for two damage. Her double palm, which she learned from Grave, reaches a bit farther than her knee. Characters can't usually cancel normal moves to super, but Setsuki's knee, elbow, and double palm can all cancel to super. Her slide doesn't cancel into her super, but it can still combo to super anyway after the slide recovers, if you hit with it just right. Her ground super, Esper Dash, has come up a lot already. Unlike most supers in Fantasy Strike, this one is mostly for combos. It's not invulnerable at the start, and one of Setsuki's weaknesses is that she has no true reversal. That said, her super does become invulnerable after it travels a bit, so you can go through projectiles if you plan ahead. Setsuki's B is her ninja port. She dashes forward and hits as she flickers into an invulnerable state, then she ends with a very high priority kick with a huge hitbox. It's kind of like a dragon punch from other games, but she can only do it after the ninja port. Her double palm combos to the first hit of the ninja port kick for a true 2 damage combo, but it's a bit risky to do because she's then committed to do the big kick at the end, which they might punish. The two hits of her ninja port kick don't usually combo, but if you space yourself correctly at the max range of the move, they do combo. The ninja port kick is great at hitting jumpers, and if the opponent doesn't jump, she can hold the B button down to end with a special throw instead. She can generally use this move to cause a lot of confusion and make the opponent question whether they should jump and which direction they should try to block. Setsuki's C button special is Starlight Tumbler. If you hold the C button down, she does a special throw that the opponent has to jump to avoid. Remember, jumps always beat special throws. If you press C instead of holding it, then you can end with either A, B, C, or Super. You basically get the same moves as if you were jumping. Ending with A, the dive kick, allows you to keep up your pressure. Ending with B can be useful to change your trajectory, allowing you to avoid things like Rook C throw. Ending with C is great to hit jumpers who are trying to avoid your special throw. Ending with super is kind of a trick shot, but it means the opponent can't simply react with a reversal every time they see your starlight tumbler. Setsuki's air super is a parry move, sort of like Graves, but with Setsuki's own flair. After she parries an attack, she disappears, leaving a log in her place. The log can hit the opponent depending on the spacing. Also, Setsuki teleports to the ground and becomes invisible. You can actually control which side she teleports to by holding left or right. Sometimes she can juggle the opponent for a second damage, but in any case, she can use her few seconds of invisibility to confuse the opponent into taking even more damage. Unlike Grave's air parry super, Setsuki's works even against projectiles. You can even use it when you're full screen from the opponent in order to turn invisible if you want. When you put all these pieces together, Setsuki can take control of a match. She can throw kunais looking for an opportunity to start her pressure. Then she can go in with Flying Fox threatening a 4 damage combo. She can also pressure with Starlight Tumbler and with her ninja port moves making the opponent feel like she's all over the place. She takes more inputs per second to play than any other character, which is fitting for a character all about speed. Keep practicing and make the Fox's Den School proud. Garrus Rook was once a man, but is now a mighty stone golem. He created the Fantasy Strike Tournament as an Olympic-style event to unite the disparate peoples of the realm. As a fighter, Rook is a grappler. He wants to get close to his opponents and throw them. And he's a grappler player's dream because he's got so many tools to get in. Plus, Rook has 8 hit points, the most in the game. His drawbacks are slow walk speed and no projectile attacks, so he really does have to get in. 
Rook's most important move is his special throw on his C button, Windmill Crusher. It has slow startup for a throw, but to make up for that, it has super armor, meaning he can take a hit and still perform a grab. That means Rook can throw opponents if they try to jump at him and attack. He can throw opponents who try to poke him or frame trap him. The throw has long enough range that he can simply walk up and throw them too. And it has a lot of active frames, so he can easily throw an opponent as they get up from a knockdown. Windmill Crusher has so many uses that opponents must respect Rook and specifically try to play around getting thrown by it. It does two damage, which is a third of most characters' hit points. What can opponents do to get out of a Windmill Crusher? To answer that, we have to understand the difference between a special throw and a normal throw in Fantasy Strike. Windmill Crusher is a special throw. You can jump to get out of special throws. Whenever you input a jump, your character takes three frames, which is 3 60th of a second, to prepare for the jump. These are called pre-jump frames, and even these pre-jump frames are immune to special throws. So if your opponent is knocked down right in front of you, and you make them get up into a windmill crusher, they can simply hold jump to always get out. Rook can mix up opponents by using his normal throw. Normal throws have fast startup, so they can start grabbing much sooner than his special C throw, and opponents cannot jump out of them. Normal throws do grab pre-jump frames. Most characters deal one damage with their normal throws, but Rook, being a grappler, deals two damage with his, and it leaves him in a very favorable position afterwards. He's close enough to threaten with his jumping splash as a cross-up. What can opponents do to get out of his normal throw? The same thing they can do to get out of any normal throw in the game. They can Yomi counter. If they completely let go of their controls, which is a very risky thing to do, then they will automatically reverse your normal throw and they'll get full super meter. Because Rook has both a great normal throw and great special throw, he threatens a mix-up. Opponents can jump out of his special throw, but they can't jump out of his normal throw. Opponents can Yomi counter out of his normal throw, but they can't Yomi counter out of his special throw. And to make his mix-up even more deadly, Rook can sometimes do normal attacks. His kick is a huge attack that reaches very far. He can poke with it and sometimes punish attacks with it. It can actually hit twice if the opponent is close enough. And even though the move is slow overall, the first hit is fast. When Rook is near a rising opponent, he can just kick before they get up to deal two damage. He'll hit opponents who tried to Yomi counter his normal throw, and he'll even hit opponents who tried to jump out of his special throw. Rook can use sweep in this situation too. It's short range, but it's also fast and it knocks down, resetting the situation. Rook's other normal attack is Thunderclap. It has a full screen vacuum effect that sucks opponents towards him, even if it whiffs, and even if they're jumping. It also has a big hitbox and it can destroy projectiles. He can use it to avoid taking block damage during his approach. And speaking of block damage, Rook's normal attacks can deal block damage because he's just that strong. Rook's other ground special is his landslide. It's an armored punch that leaps forward. It can take one hit and still keep going, so it can punch through various attacks and projectiles. Landslide is especially useful if you cancel your Thunderclap into it. Thunderclap can cancel to your B and C specials on hit or block, even if the hit is just destroying a projectile. So you can destroy a projectile, then cancel Thunderclap's recovery into an immediate landslide to hit the opponent if they immediately throw a second projectile. Or you could cancel into a Windmill Crusher if they try to punish your Thunderclap with an attack. Careful though, if they're ready for this, they can be patient and beat it. While jumping, Rook has two special moves that help him get in. First, his Air B's spinning vines can attack through projectiles. That's a crucial tool in some matchups. Next, his Air C's Earthquake knocks down opponents from any range, even full screen, but it doesn't damage them. It's unblockable when done from far away like this. After he knocks down an opponent this way, he can then quickly do landslide to get close and threaten a throw. This ground pound is fast enough that even when Rook is a full screen away, he can still threaten opponents with it. Rook's ground super is an amazing throw that deals a whopping three damage. When he activates it, he's invulnerable for a few frames before the cinematic startup. The startup is incredibly fast, which makes Rook especially deadly when he has super meter. Though the opponent can jump out of this throw, if they haven't already started jumping before the cinematic, then it's too late. This makes the mix-up we talked about earlier even more scary. For example, if your opponent gets up next to you and they plan to be tricky by doing nothing for a few frames to possibly Yomi counter your normal throw, 
and then they hold back just in case you tried to kick, Rook Super beats all of that. They didn't jump, then they're thrown. The Super can also be used against jump ends. It has infinite hits of super armor. Even though he might get hit and take damage by the attack, he won't be interrupted and he'll still throw the opponent if they land within range. His air super is a headbutt. It's a very high priority attack, and if it hits right at the beginning, it triggers a cinematic for two damage. This allows Rook to own air-to-air -air interactions. He can even use it as an anti-air, making it hard for opponents to approach him. Rook has a wide variety of tools to help him get in. He can spin through projectiles or thunderclap them. He can knock down from full screen, dash in with landslide, or just walk up and throw using his long range normal and special throws. And when he's in, his throw game is solid as a rock. Lum Bam Fu is a panda who loves gambling, as most pandas do. He's a good natured jokester and he just wants some exciting, mildly annoying things to happen. It's hard to classify Lum's gameplay, being the wild card that he is, but he basically wants some breathing room in order to set up a bunch of chaos that he hopes ends up going his way. Lum's C button, item toss, is the heart of his character. He throws one of several random items and you can't control which one you get. Fireworks is the best item. Lum throws a rocket into the air and then a few seconds later, fireworks rain down. These fireworks cannot hit Lum, only the opponent, so it gives Lum a chance to go on the offense while the opponent is probably forced to block. You only get fireworks a small percentage of the time though. Throw as many items as possible to maximize your chances, and then improvise to do your best with whatever you get. His coin, from the card game Pandante, is good anti-air. The bomb can hit both characters, so be careful. The cloud, which is inspired by Graves' moves, strikes lightning below. It even automatically strikes if an opponent is underneath. The cherries restore one hit point, but either player can pick them up. The cake gives plus 50% super meter, but any player can pick that up too. The miniature version of Lum crawls along the ground slowly and is actually pretty annoying to deal with. Also, while he's crawling, he no longer counts towards Lum's one at a time limit of items, so you can throw another item, maybe even another mini Lum. Mini Rook is a very rare item. He's kind of like Mini Lum, except he has three hit points. So when he hits the opponent, or if the opponent hits him, he keeps going until he's down to zero hit points. Speaking of items, Lum's ground super is slots of items. He operates a slot machine that spews out four random items. Lum can throw an item with the C button and then immediately super for a total of five items. It causes a lot of chaos. If you happen to get a cake or two, you can even immediately use the slot machine again. The slot machine itself can hit the opponent, so you can use it as a sort of reversal attack. The first frame they can hit on, Lum is vulnerable though, so if you're in a bad spot, it might trade and it won't spit out any items if it does, but it is Lum's only good defensive option in a tight spot. Lum's normal moves are generally big because he's a big panda. His back plus A knocks down, his forward plus A reaches a little bit farther, his neutral A is great anti-air and it's pretty fast, his jumping A is good for cross-ups and good for jump-in combos. Lum's B is a rolling attack. This helps him get around the playfield quickly and is especially good for picking up any cherries or cakes that he tosses out. His Air B, Polar Cartwheel, is an unusual move. Lum is totally vulnerable and cannot even hit the opponent as he dives down, lands on the trampoline, and starts to jump off. After this long startup period though, he cartwheels in the air with amazing hitboxes and priority. It's also completely safe and he can combo after it. Lum is especially well suited to have a move like this because he can do the move when items are keeping the opponent too busy to hit him out of his startup. His Air C is a projectile, and although it's slow, that can actually be useful because it gives him more hang time. This helps him avoid the blast from his own bombs. Lum's Air Super, Roll the Dice, summons three huge dice that he can then bounce around the playfield. Different attacks cause the dice to fly in different directions. His rolling attack is especially useful to knock all the dice at once, often in an attempt to deal block damage. He can also save them for combos, or bounce them around one at a time to make it hard for the opponent to attack him. 
Lum's weakness is that he doesn't have a great reversal, meaning a fast attack to get him out of trouble. And he needs a bit of time to get his item craziness going, but if the opponent fails to pressure him enough, he can create some crazy situations that make him feel incredibly powerful. To play Lum, you have to really improvise, develop your item sense, and take advantage of whatever happens, and a lot can happen. So roll the dice, play the slots, and make the gambling pandas proud. Cyrus Quince is the chief magistrate of Flagstone. He's a charismatic, duly elected leader who has only the best interests of the people in mind. There are those, such as the lawyer de Grey, who say that Quince's reputation is built entirely on lies and illusions, but they're just dissidents and criminals. Quince is a tricky, deceptive character. He uses mix-ups so the opponent doesn't know how to block, and illusions so they don't know what to attack. Though he may seem slightly weak when the opponent is wise to his illusions, his power level skyrockets for brief moments when he can make his illusions real. He requires a lot of knowledge to play well. Quince's B special is High Standard, a forward lunging kick. Afterwards, an illusion of Quince automatically appears above the opponent and dashes downward to do his Low Standard. The illusion can't hit or be hit though, it's just for confusion. But if you press the B button twice, then the real quince performs the high standard, then low standard, and the illusion becomes the quince that stood still between those moves. Low standard is a cross-up, so the opponent will have to block it the other way, but they aren't sure which quince is real, so if they try to block low standard, they might end up walking into your attack or throw. Quince's neutral A is a simple punch, but a very important one. It's his fastest hitting ground move, and it can combo into his B attack. Also, if he does BB and the low standard cross-up hits, he can then combo that to A and then B for 3 damage while keeping the opponent in his mix-up blender. His back A normal attack is Truth Geyser, a ground pound that erupts a fountain of coins because money is the ultimate truth. This move launches on hit, allowing for a juggle. It's easy to juggle with his forward A lunging punch. The sequence back A, forward A, cancel to B will deal 2 damage and cause the B to hit very meaty. That's an unfortunate fighting game term, meaning that the very end of the attack will touch them and it makes you especially safe afterwards. His forward A is also notable in that you can hold the button down to send out an illusion to fool the opponent. They might try to react to it, but the real quince is waiting to punish. It's fast, so it's low risk to throw out that illusion here and there. Quince's C special move, Dodge the Question, can get him out of trouble. He's invulnerable from the very first frame of this attack as he splits into two images. This lets him slip out of sticky situations as the expert politician he is. You control which Quince is the real one by holding left or right. After the split, he will automatically perform his Righteous Zeal attack, and so will the illusion of him. If the opponent expects this move, they can punish it, but it can be pretty confusing which is which. Quince's jumping attacks are a punch, his B button positive spin, and his C button mirror called alternative facts. There's a lot going on with his positive spin move. It's generally unsafe, but there's a lot he can do with it. First, he can hold down the button to make an illusion of it. The real Quince will continue his jump arc when you do this, so you can create a positive spin illusion, then come down with a real punch. Next, after doing either a real or illusion version of this move, he can do another action in the air. So he can do air B twice in a row, or an illusion B and then a real B, or a real B and then an illusion B. That sequence is especially useful because it leaves him safe afterwards. His air C mirror can hit the opponent for zero damage, which is still useful because it puts them in hit stun and generally gets in their way. It can also reflect projectiles. That's pretty useful, but you can also put it over their head anytime you get a chance, then start pressuring. Another use of the mirror is placing it after doing Air B, just to get it in their way. You can even set up tricky situations like knocking them down with Air B, placing the mirror behind them, and then threaten with a lunge punch. If it hits, the mirror's hit stun allows you to combo a punch into B for 3 damage. You can also just stay back, place a mirror, and do some illusion air B moves just to give the opponent the opportunity to react in a stupid way. Quince's ground super, Patriot Mirror, gives him access to a huge amount of power if he can pull it off. The mirror itself can reflect projectiles, and while it doesn't do any damage, if it hits, it then triggers a time-limited mode called Two Truths. A blue meter counts down, showing how much time you have left in this mode. 
in the mode, all his illusions are real. That means they can actually hit the opponent. If the opponent hits an illusion, it will go away, but the true quince won't take any damage. During Two Truths, your Lunch Punch becomes a rapid-fire lockdown. It will only combo twice, but it's still pretty good. His Air B becomes a huge, slow-moving projectile that he can do twice each jump. And pressing Ground B once for high standard gives you the benefit of a real illusion low standard without the true quince having to spend time in that animation. That lets him do some powerful combos, mix-ups, and lockdowns. Another note about Patriot Mirror, even if they block it, the mirror won't go away until they block it three times. That gives you a chance to mix them up with BB while they're stuck blocking. Quince's Air Super, Consent of the Governed, is a full-screen flying punch. Regardless of if it hits or not, two illusionary Quinces appear to fight alongside you. They do random moves and create a lot of confusion. Consent of the Governed is invulnerable at the start, which ensures you'll win any air-to-air -air battles. This is especially important after your B Special, High Standard. That puts opponents in a mix-up where they don't know if you'll attack or throw from the front, or cross up from behind, and they might try to jump out to avoid that mix-up. If they do, you can beat their jump with your invulnerable Air Super. You can even use the Air Super as a way to get in safely and start your mix-up since it's safe on block. If your Air Super counter hits, meaning hits the opponent out of the start of their move, it has the special property of giving you full super meter. It also causes a ground bounce that lets you combo for 3 damage or combo into your Patriot Mirror ground super. Your dream scenario is if you can be in 2 truths mode from Patriot Mirror while also having illusions out from your Consent of the Governed Air Super. The two ways to do that are to counter hit with the Air Super, then combo into the ground super as we just showed, or you can start off by hitting with the ground super, then Yomi counter a throw to get full super meter, then immediately air super. Either way, if you pull off this dream scenario, you'll be fighting alongside multiple illusionary copies of Quince that can actually hit the opponent, while still being able to spawn illusions from your other moves that can really hit the opponent too. It's ridiculous! Quince sometimes has to stay back and just place mirrors and poke with air B cancelled into illusion air B while he looks for openings. When he really gets going, though, he can put his opponent on tilt as they question how and what they're even supposed to block. He loves being in two truths mode as much as he can because he loves honesty and truth. And why just have one truth when you can have two? Jaina Stormborn is reckless, rebellious, and a bit of a show-off. That's exactly why Master Midori taught her archery as a way to instill some patience. She wields a magical bow with an endless supply of flame arrows. Jaina is a strong zoning character, one of the best in the game at keeping opponents away. She does it by creating an obstacle course of flame arrows. Her B button shoots a flame arrow. She can do that on the ground or in the air. On the ground, she can hold down the B button to charge it up. Her level two shot destroys enemy projectiles and keeps on going. Her level three shot is unblockable. In the air, holding B doesn't charge up her shots, but it does allow her to extend her hang time, which can be helpful. Jaina's Air C shoots a different kind of flame arrow diagonally up, and then it rains down a bit later. The most important thing to know about it is that she can have as many of these shots on screen as she can get. Usually, in Fantasy Strike and most fighting games, you can't shoot a projectile while your previous projectile is still on screen. For example, Jaina can only have one horizontal shot on screen at any given time, whether that's her air B or her ground B, but she can do air C shots in addition to that. And to amp it up, her air super fires off three of these shots at once and all of that can be in addition as well. For example, she can jump C and then jump air super and then land and shoot her horizontal B shot. That's a lot of projectiles at once and it's also a good setup to try and land her unblockable level three shot while the opponent is dealing with the rain of fire. Jaina's knee, her forward A normal attack, has a lot of uses. She can travel forward quickly with it, and it's a pretty high priority attack. On hit or on block, she can cancel into an air special. This lets her combo knee into air B for two hits. If you happen to hit the opponent out of the air really high up, you can actually combo into another knee and then into air B for three damage. Her neutral A is a fast kick that also cancels the specials. Her jumping A is a dive kick with a very shallow angle. She can't really use it to get close to opponents, but if she's already near them, it lets her put together some pretty good rushdown. Her standard three hit combo is dive kick, knee, air B. She can also dive kick, neutral A, ground B. 
Her roundhouse kick, done with back plus A, can't cancel the special moves, but it reaches pretty far. It lets her poke or sometimes punish things that she otherwise couldn't, because her roundhouse hits faster at long range than any of her other attacks. Jaina usually wants to keep opponents away and make them deal with a lot of arrow shots, but what if they manage to get close? She has two invulnerable moves to knock opponents off her, but they each have drawbacks. Keep in mind that even a bad reversal attack is extremely powerful on a solid keep away character. Jaina's first reversal option is Dragonheart, which is her ground C attack. It's an invulnerable dragon punch style move that knocks opponents away. It has slow startup, but even more notably, it damages herself. Yes, really. You have to be very careful with this move, but if you only have one life left, it won't kill you, so you can go hog wild at that point. But keep in mind that Dragonheart is completely unsafe on block. Even though taking self damage is a big drawback, it can be worth it. If the opponent is jumping in at you and you have to choose between blocking or Dragonheart, well, if you block, it lets the opponent start doing what they want to do, but if you Dragonheart, it will damage them for one, as well as damage you for one, and it will leave the opponent at full screen. They'll probably have to block your next flame arrow too. That way, you're doing what you want to do. Jaina's second reversal option is her ground super, Red Dragon. It doesn't cost her life to use, but it has an enormously long startup. She has to predict a move quite early to hit with Red Dragon. Jumping opponents can even block it on a reaction if she does it too late. It still has its uses though and it does 2 damage on hit. Jaina excels at filling the screen with flame arrows and forcing the opponent to figure out how to deal with it all. She can vary the timing of her obstacle course to frustrate opponents. If they stay back, they'll end up taking block damage or even get hit by her unblockable level 3 shot as her air super rains down. When things go wrong, can you afford the one life to Dragonheart them off you? Can you afford not to? Jaina is a bit of a paradox in that she combines patience and recklessness in her own unusual style. Argagar Garg is a water shaman and patient fish, known in his circles for his wise advice, even though outsiders wrongly view the fish folk as a savage and violent race, but they couldn't be more wrong. Argagarg is a zoner, a keep-away character. His long-range attacks and water waves keep his opponents far away while his poison ticks away at their life. Let's start with his normal attacks. His forward A attack reaches across the entire screen and you can cancel it to special moves. It's a great zoning tool. His back A punches are short range but very high priority. Have the courage to use this small but effective attack to hit jumping opponents and keep them off of you. His neutral A punch reaches really far, and while it doesn't have the high priority of his back A, the range makes up for it. If you counter hit a jumper, that is, hit them out of the startup of their attack, they'll fall on their back, and you can combo to forward A for 2 damage. Also keep in mind that Argagard can cancel all three of his ground normal attacks into specials. Jumping A is another long range attack, this time diagonally downward. Argagard's flying fish moves are done with the B button, he can press B for a blue fish made of water, or hold B for a purple, poisoned version. The poison version is central to his character, so let's cover that first. The poison fish is really large for starters. It also passes through all obstacles. Enemy projectiles or other objects can't stop it. And it's unblockable. Yes, really, it's unblockable. When it hits, it poisons the opponent. They don't take any damage immediately, but they'll eventually take 2 damage from this poison unless they hit you. If they hit Argagarg while they're poisoned, they'll be cured. While they're poisoned, there's an icon of a flask that moves across their life bar. That shows how long until the poison will take away that particular hit point. Notice that if the opponent gets knocked down or if they put Argagarg into block stun by forcing him to block a move, the flask will momentarily pause its countdown. That's minor though, the main thing to understand here is that the poison fish's unblockable, unstoppable nature forces the opponent to act. They can't just sit there and do nothing. You can also stack multiple poison fish to poison more and more of their life bar. They could be on the hook to lose 6 or 8 hit points if you can keep them away for that long. And that brings us to the drawback of this move. If they hit you within a few seconds of getting poisoned, then the poison didn't actually do anything. You have to be able to keep them away long enough for the poison to tick to harness Argagarg's full potential. Also, the poison fish has another unusual drawback. It doesn't cause any hit stun. The opponent can simply hit you while you're doing it. They can walk straight through it, 
get hit by it, but then hit you back. So be careful to only use it when it's safe. You get the poison fish by holding down the B button, but if you press and release the B button, you'll get the blue flying fish. This one is made of water, so it doesn't actually deal any damage at all. It does splash opponents on hit and stuns them for so long that you can usually hit them with your forward A attack for one damage. And even if you don't hit them with that, it's still valuable to waste their time with the blue fish if they're poisoned. Archigarg's C special move is Rushing River. He summons a river of water that pushes opponents back. Again, this is helpful to waste their time if they're poisoned and to keep them away from Archigarg regardless of whether they're poisoned or not. He's better off fighting from a distance. While the river is out, you can press C again to summon an orange fish that jumps out of the river. You can hold back, neutral, or forward during that C button press to get three different angles of this fish. It's a real fish, not made of water, so it does actual damage. The neutral version of this is great for keeping away opponents and hitting them if they try to jump in. The back version is good at hitting jumpers who are much closer to you, and the forward version is good for applying some pressure. You can also summon these orange fish even while you're doing another move, or while you're in block stun. There's a bunch of trickery you can do with this, on both the air and the ground. Air B is his staff drill. It's a pretty good priority attack that can be used defensively if you jump back into it, or offensively if you jump forward into it. You usually can't combo after it, but you can at least try to pressure afterwards. Air C is his sparkling bubble. This lets him travel horizontally through the air, and you can hold left or right as you initiate it to travel either direction. During your travels, you can press C again to pop the bubble. The pop is invulnerable after a short startup. You can use this bubble even after doing your jumping A punch. That lets you hit the opponent and then back away to safety, or pressure them and threaten a pop if you're feeling risky. You can also combine the bubble with the ground C's orange fish. Do rushing river, then immediately jump in sparkling bubble. As you travel, pressing C will summon the river's orange fish. Then you can choose to pop the bubble with another C button press if you want. For an even more powerful bubble, Argagarg's ground super is Bubble Shield. This summons a bubble around him that you can pop by pressing S again. While the bubble is popping, Argagarg can still move around, block, do attacks, etc. The pop even moves forward with him if you walk. Another really powerful aspect of Bubble Shield is that you can pop it even if you're in block stun. So you can block a move, and while you're stuck in block pose for a moment, you can pop the bubble to hit the opponent out of their attack. Plus, there's another powerful property of Bubble Shield. When you initiate it, the game is briefly paused. This lets you see what the opponent is doing, and it allows you to do the correct response on reaction. It's especially good to do as you get it from a knockdown when the opponent has you in a mix-up. Another property to know about, while Bubble Shield is up, your Air C Sparkling Bubble is powered up too. It travels faster, and the pop of this Super Bubble has a huge invulnerable hitbox. You'll fall to the ground faster after popping it too. While you're falling from this Air Super Pop, you can do another Air move before you land. Try popping the Powered Up Bubble in the air, and then Air A for a combo, or pop and then back Air C to run away. That said, you'll use up your Bubble Shield this way. That can be worth it since you're building up Super Meter this whole time anyway. Argagarg's Air Super, Giant Fish, is straightforward to use because it does exactly what he generally wants to do. Push the opponent away and waste their time. It's especially annoying when he combines it with his Ground B and C special moves to keep them away. Let's look more closely at some pressure sequences Argagarg can do to keep the opponent busy. When you do Rushing River, you can then spit a flying fish right afterwards, then summon the river's orange fish. Follow up with Forward A, Flying Fish again, and then repeat the sequence. Or you can open with the Forward A Long Punch, cancel to Flying Fish, Rushing River, Flying Fish, Orange Fish, and then Air Super. You can then Long Punch them before and after the giant fish hits for a great combo, and then keep up the pressure afterwards. Even on block, this wastes a lot of time and lets your poison damage tick. Archigarg is a difficult character to play, not because doing any of his moves is hard, but because there's so much he can do, and it will all fall apart unless you can zone them long enough for Poison to do something. And you have to really know how to get out of trouble with brave uses of back A, bubble shield, or just a lot of blocking when you're getting pressured. And you have to take control of the match with maximum obnoxiousness when you're far away. 
Philosophically, Argagard believes in defeating opponents through patience, and if you actually have the patience to learn to play him, then you will truly understand him, as his fellow fish do. Valerie Rose is a creative painter with the bursts of energy and feelings of despair that come with manic depression. She also has heterochromia, meaning she has one green eye and one blue eye, which might be why she sees things differently. Valerie is a rushdown character. She can deal high damage and she can apply a lot of pressure through block damage and mix-ups. She only has five hit points though, which is tied for least in the game. Valerie's Three Colors series is her most important attack string. By pressing B three times, she paints attacks with cyan, magenta, and yellow colors in quick succession. During each of these three hits, you can hold back, neutral, or forward to change the ranges of the moves. The first two hits, cyan and magenta, are a true combo, but the yellow hit that comes third does not combo. Instead, it's a mix-up. You can hold forward during yellow, and you will cross the opponent up. Hold neutral during yellow to stay on the same side instead. You can also hold back during yellow to do a quick retreat. This can bait the opponent into attacking. Try cyan magenta retreat, then cyan magenta again for some pressure. Valerie's C button move is rainbow stroke. It's a pretty high priority attack that hits at a lot of angles. The startup of it can even go through projectiles. Valerie can do a rainbow stroke during her three color series too. She can do cyan into it or cyan then magenta into rainbow stroke. Rainbow Stroke is safe on block, so it's a good ender. The sequence Cyan, Magenta, Rainbow Stroke is three different special moves, which is enough to deal a full point of block damage. That's a lot of pressure, especially considering it's at least two damage if the Cyan move happens to hit. Air C is her flying Rainbow Stroke. It's pretty similar to the ground version, but it travels much farther. It's useful to get in an opponent if you're far away, and if you happen to hit jumping opponents with it, you can juggle for extra damage. Valerie's Air B cross stroke move is a deadly cross up. Its disadvantage is that it cannot hit until just after she lands, but once she does, the paint trail behind her hits and it can be hard to block. On hit, she can combo into BB. Even on block, that's a guaranteed full point of block damage. Valerie's normal attacks are quite good as well. Her forward A is a very long and fast poke. Her neutral A is fast too, and it can cancel to specials. If you cancel it with B, it will go directly into the yellow attack though, not the full cyan magenta yellow sequence. Even A to yellow is effective because it threatens a mix-up as to which side the yellow will hit them on. Her double kick is a slow attack, but still a very useful one. It does two damage if it hits, and if they block it, Valerie recovers soon enough to have lots of frame advantage. That, combined with her already fast moves, means the opponent will likely get hit if they try to do anything after blocking it. It even has a bit of throw and vulnerability as she hops forward. Her jumping A can be a high source of damage. She can press A twice to air juggle for two damage. She can often land and juggle with a neutral A for a third point of damage and then cancel that into yellow to force a mix up for a possible fourth point of damage. She can also get four damage off jumping AA then BB after landing. Valerie's ground super, Chromatic Orb, is kind of like a dragon punch in other fighting games. It's invulnerable and gets opponents off her if she's getting pressured too much. It only does one damage, though against cornered jumpers she can juggle for a second damage. While Chromatic Orb can be good anti-air and can be used to bait opponents into attacking at wrong times, it's her other super that's truly deadly. Her air super is Rainbow Disc. It has slow startup so she has to really earn a moment in the fight to summon it. If she can put it above an opponent, she can go crazy though. If they get hit, they will take a ton of damage. If they block, they'll take a ton of block damage. Be careful though, while they're blocking the disc, they're still able to do fast, invulnerable attacks between hits. She can go for mix-ups like repeated cross strokes or multiple yellow swipes while they're locked in place. Try to save your meter for rainbow discs if you can, but settle for chromatic orb if you're getting pressured too much. Valerie has the potential to deal a lot of damage really fast. She can trick opponents with frame traps from her double kick, with retreats from her three colors, and she can force them to block correctly or die against deadly cross strokes and rainbow discs. You might feel down sometimes when things don't line up, like when you die because you only have five hit points. But when a plan comes together with Valerie, it feels like a work of art. 
Master Ando Midori taught Grave and Jaina how to fight. He's a careful, honorable teacher who is able to take the form of a mighty dragon. Midori is a grappler. He has no projectiles, so he wants to get close and throw his opponents. Every so often, he can transform into a dragon, which lets him play as an entirely different, very powerful character. Midori's normal throw is one of his most important moves. It has really long range and it does two damage. It also leaves the opponent standing, so they have to think quickly about what to do next, as Midori can threaten to loop into another throw. Midori's normal attacks are his chop, double strike, and sweep. By pressing the A button twice, he does a rapid flurry of punches. You can mash A and he'll keep doing more flurries. He can also cancel his chop or his double strike into this. When an opponent gets up near Midori, they might be afraid of his throw. If they expect a throw, they might let go of their controls and try to Yomi counter him. The mix-up is that instead of throwing, he can simply press AA to hit them for two damage. Midori's C button is a parry. It doesn't work against throws or projectiles, but if a strike hits his parry, he'll take no damage and automatically hit back. He also gains super meter for parrying. If this parry strike actually hits the opponent, Midori gains a crazy power-up and a glow showing that he's in this empowered mode. While empowered, if Midori is able to throw the opponent, he does so automatically with no button presses, with a special throw that only happens in this mode. There are a lot of crazy uses of this, and Midori can even hold back to block while still threatening this throw. The opponent can jump out of this special throw, though they can't Yomi counter it. After Midori performs his empowered throw, he'll lose the special state, and he has to parry another attack to get into it again. If he gets hit while empowered, he'll also lose the state. Interestingly though, if he's in the empowered mode, you can still normal throw. That's good to do because it does two damage instead of the empower throws one damage and it lets you keep the empowered throw so you can continue to threaten with it. Midori's B button does a flying kick on the ground or in the air. This is mainly to help him get close to the opponent. His air C is a flying butt slam. It hits on the way down, but not on the way up, and is surprisingly safe on block, allowing for some throw setups. This is very useful in helping him get in because it can avoid a lot of obstacles the opponent might put up. Midori's jumping forward A is a fairly shallow jump kick that can lead to a combo. His jumping straight up A is a different move though and it gives him a little extra mobility. He can steer it forward or back in the air. Steering forward can help get over projectiles and generally helps him threaten with it. Steering back allows him to attack but pull back from danger if the situation looks bad. Midori's super, both ground and air versions, transforms him into a dragon. Remember, parrying gives him super meter, so the more moves you parry, the more you'll be able to turn into dragon form. While in dragon form, your super meter counts down, giving you a time limit until you revert back to human form. You do get to remain in dragon form across rounds. His dragon moves are generally crazy. His AA does a two-hit attack with enormous hitboxes. It's great anti-air and it does two damage. He can even still do air moves after his AA. His forward AA reaches pretty far and does two damage as well. His back plus A is a tail sweep that reaches ridiculously far and fast. Midori's dragon form B on the ground and in the air is a torpedo that's way more powerful than his human form's flying kick. It's fast and high priority. When the ground version hits or is blocked, he bounces back and can still do air moves, such as another air beam. His dragon form C button does different kinds of throws in the ground and in the air. On the ground, he dashes forward and goes for a dragon buster. The dash has infinite hits of super armor, meaning no matter how many times he gets hit during it, he keeps going and still tries to throw. His air C is a talon swoop that flies across the screen to grab opponents. Both these throws deal two damage. Neither can be Yomi countered, and in both cases the opponent can jump out. Let's not forget his jumping A in dragon form, it's probably the best normal attack in the game. It's huge, high priority, and hits for 2 damage. Another thing you should be aware of is how his transformation itself affects gameplay. As he transforms, gameplay briefly pauses, and this gives you a moment to react to what the opponent is doing. You can transform, then AA to anti-air them if they jumped or transform and C if you see that they'll be unable to avoid that special throw, or simply transform and normal throw them suddenly. Midori's incredible bear hug throw and parry make him scary when up close, but he can struggle to get in sometimes. Opponents can't keep him away forever though. If they stall long enough, they're just letting him turn into a dragon. 
Why not be a dragon the entire match then, you ask? Because a win doesn't really mean much unless it's done fair and honorably. So, you know, only a little bit of dragon here and there. Jefferson de Grey is a lawyer who fights for justice. His primary motivation is exposing the truth, and his primary physical skill is punching. De Grey was granted unnaturally long life by Persephone, and she left behind her ghostly friend to watch over de Grey and make sure he keeps up his quest of fighting tyrants. De Grey's gameplay isn't about rushdown exactly, and it isn't about zoning either. It's about frame trapping, which means making the opponent attack at the wrong times and punishing them for it greatly. Whenever you hit an opponent out of the startup of their moves in Fantasy Strike, you get a counter hit that stuns them slightly longer. But De Grey in particular has a special property. His counter hits cause much more dramatic effects, like wall bounces and ground bounces. De Grey's B button special is Counterpoint Step. He quickly dashes back, then forward again, and he can end the move three different ways by pressing either A, B, or C. A ends with Daggerfall Thrust, a punch that's very safe on block and gives a lot of frame advantage which you can see from the blue symbol that appears on block. B ends with his powerful Tyrant Crusher, which does two damage. If you counter hit with it, it wall bounces the opponent and you can Tyrant Crusher again. He even says a different voice line if you do. Ending with C does Justice Kicks, an invulnerable attack that's unsafe on block. DeGray's C button sends his ghost out to grab the opponent. If she grabs them, she won't do any damage, but they're stunned briefly so DeGray can hit them himself. A good technique is to send out the ghost, then counterpoint step, and simply react to what happens. If the ghost grabs, then tyrant crusher. If not, then end with a safe punch or with no ender at all. Air C also summons the ghost and can be used in similar ways to the ground C. You can also do some cross-up trickery with the air version. Degray's neutral A punch can combo to a second hit if you press A twice. If the ghost grabs the opponent when you're nearby, this is a good way to get too quick damage or you can punch punch and then cancel the second punch into the ghost summon to keep up the pressure. His forward A is a forward moving shoulder attack that he can cancel into ground specials. His back A ground pound has really long range and on counter hit, it sends the opponent flying so you can tyrant crusher them. You can actually combo his shoulder attack and then tyrant crusher if the ground pound counter hit, which lets him do four damage mid screen, but you have to really work to set up that situation. DeGray's Air B can cancel to a second hit if you press the button twice. This move gives him a lot of mobility and it lets him chase down opponents if he's far away. He can jump in and go for two damage with it, and on block, opponents aren't sure if he'll do one or two attacks. As an air-to-air -air move, it's difficult to juggle for two damage with it, but on counter hit, it is possible. DeGray's Ground Super is a parry move called Ghost Repost. If an opponent attacks into it with a strike, he'll automatically reverse it into a powerful two-fisted punch for two damage. Opponents can throw to Gray if he tries to go for this, and they can hit him with projectiles, but the threat of Ghost Repost can make it difficult for some characters to attack him. De Gray's Air Super, Final Arbiter, is a fast, full-screen punch of justice. He can use it to get in or to sneak in a point of damage that he couldn't otherwise get, but the real dream is if you counter hit with it. In that case, it is a whopping three damage, so the fun of this move is fishing for that moment when you think the opponent will do something and then counter hit them out of it. Playing to Gray has a different rhythm than other characters. He wants to counterpoint step a lot and send out his ghost a lot. He's fishing for a moment when the opponent does the wrong thing, so he can suddenly do a lot of damage. As a lawyer, to Gray will tell you that his opponents are bound to make a misplay sooner or later, and when they do, he'll be ready. General Onomaru is a master tactician in charge of the Flagstone Army. He's physically imposing and demands discipline from his soldiers. He's also adept at personal combat, where he wields an enormous sword. Onomaru's moves and movement are generally very slow, but extremely powerful. He deals a ton of damage and uses armor to power through hits to create favorable trades. Onomaru has a unique mechanic called Guard Crush. Normally, when opponents block three special or super moves, they lose a point of life, which we call block damage. But against Onomaru, rather than taking block damage, they get hit for real. To help opponents know they're in danger of this, whenever they block two such moves, a shield icon with a crack in it appears over their character, indicating they're in danger of a guard crush. If they try to block a third move capable of block damage, that icon shatters and they get hit rather than blocking. 
Onomaru's Guard Crush is even more threatening because all his blade attacks are capable of dealing block damage, even two of his normal moves, back A and forward A. Back A is a sweep, while forward A is a deadly overhead slice that deals two damage. His neutral A doesn't deal block damage, but it's his fastest attack. All of these normal attacks can cancel to special moves. Onomaru's B special attack, Tactical Slice, is a poke with huge range that deals a whopping two damage. The part where he spins around is invulnerable to projectiles, so he can step around them to hit the opponent. The recovery of this move puts him in a special stance where he can't block, but he can do three different enders, Shoulder Ram, Spirit Fire, or Parry. Press A for a fast Shoulder Ram that gives frame advantage on block. Or press B for a slow attack with big range that has an active hitbox for a long time due to the samurai spirits it summons. Those spirits can destroy projectiles too. Or press C for a parry that's invulnerable to strikes and projectiles and that automatically hits back if Onomaru gets hit. You can also hold the C button down to extend the duration of your parry attempt. It lasts pretty long this way. The parry is important because threatening it makes the opponent afraid to attack during the recovery of your tactical slice. If you know they will hesitate, then you don't need to parry at all and you can apply pressure with either the shoulder ram or the spirit fire follow-up. Another thing to know about the special stance after his B is that you can back dash or forward dash, but only once. To dash from the stance, you either tap forward forward or back back for a back dash, or you can hold forward plus jump, or back plus jump for back dash. If you back dash, you'll end the stance and be able to block. If you forward dash, you'll still be in the stance and able to threaten to parry. Onomaru's walk speed is so slow that he actually travels more quickly across the screen by doing B, then forward dash, then shoulder ram, than if he walked or jumped forward. Onomaru's forward A, which does 2 damage, can cancel into his B special, which also does 2 damage, but usually this isn't a true combo. If the opponent happens to get counter hit by the forward A, meaning hit out of the start of their move, then they'll glow red, B and hit stun longer, and these two moves actually will combo for a total of 4 damage. That's so devastating that you can fish for it and hope you catch the opponent in the start of a move. If they block, you can still do the two-move sequence and then mix up which ender you'll do from Tactical Slice. Another technique to keep in mind is if you're close, you can pressure the opponent with B, A for Shoulder Ram, Neutral A, Hilt Bash, then repeat. You can't keep it up forever, and they can do a fast or invulnerable move to get out, but it's still a good pressure tool. His C special, Divide and Conquer, is a two-hit move that's armored. The armor is really important because it allows you to attack even if the opponent is doing a faster move. You might get hit, but you'll hit them too. You can use the move on prediction against projectiles from far away, and you can use it as anti-air too. You'll sometimes even get both hits against the jumping opponent. His jumping A is a bunt that bounces him on hit or block. He can bounce up to three times for three hits. That's not a combo, but it can be tricky and confusing. Although he's often punishable, the opponent doesn't know if you'll do one, two, or three attacks. His jumping B, Spirit Slice, is a really long-reaching horizontal attack. Its hitbox stays active for a really long time as the samurai spirits come out. This move can command the air-to-air -air game, but it also lets Onomaru come down on grounded opponents. He can even threaten it as he jumps over a projectile. The very beginning of Spirit Slice is a strike attack as the sword hits, but the rest of the active frames are classified as a projectile. That means the magical samurai heads can actually destroy enemy projectiles if they happen to intersect. It means that Rook's Air B vines can go through them too, but not through the beginning part where the sword itself hits. His jumping C, Helmbreaker, has him slam down to the ground. It's armored so he'll keep going even if he gets hit once. This move does 2 damage on hit, but it can't actually hit the opponent until it lands. And though it has long recovery, you can cancel that recovery with an invulnerable rising sword by pressing C again. This makes the opponent hesitant to punish this move on block because they aren't sure if you have a rising sword waiting for them. You can vary the timing of when you rising sword to further trick them. Rising sword doesn't usually combo after Helmbreaker unless the Helmbreaker was a counter hit. In that case, you can combo easily if you're close enough. Onomaru's ground super is Martial Law. It's a huge two damage sword slash that's invulnerable until just before it hits. It has two other important properties too. First, it's fast. 
it's twice as fast as his other pokes, so he can punish things or interrupt things with it that he otherwise couldn't. Second, you can hold down the S button when you do it to charge up and perform a level 2 or level 3 version. These versions are not invulnerable, but the level 2 version reaches even farther and it does 3 damage, while the level 3 version reaches full screen, does 4 damage, and is unblockable. This super has many incredible uses. It gets you out of trouble. It reaches through projectiles, and even if you get hit, you deal your damage first, so maybe you'll win the round just before you die. Sometimes getting hit out of it lets you combo forward A for 4 damage total. You can land the super after a successful parry. You can use it as anti-air. You can whiff punish things. The level 3 unblockable has a lot of uses too. When you get a knockdown from the parry, or from air B, or from a counter hit air C, you can start charging to level 3 and threaten to do an unblockable as the opponent gets up. You can also threaten it if the opponent commits to a slow move from far, or even if they just hesitate and don't know what to do. His air super, Clockwork Soldiers, summons two robot soldiers that advance toward the enemy. They each have two hit points, so it's pretty difficult for the opponent to deal with them and Onomaru at the same time. He has a lot of potential to guard crush them during this super. A single attack from the opponent can hit both Onomaru and one of the Clockwork Soldiers, so Onomaru has to be careful in how he pressures. Try to set up deadly guard crushes while also baiting the opponent to do something dumb. Onomaru is somewhat slow and deliberate, but he's also incredibly damaging with his 2 damage attacks, 4 damage unblockable super, and unblockable guard crush setups. He usually wants to stay at mid-range and rely on his high priority sword attacks as well as his armored moves to blow through the attacks of faster, weaker characters. If you know the enemy and know your Onomaru tools, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles.